So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the uh, Autumn Insect Webinar. My name is Zorica Djuric. I'm field crop entomologist here in Tamworth Agricultural Institute. This webinar is organized jointly by New South Wales DPI and QDAF as part of uh, GRDC investment under IPM for Grains project, which is led by Caesar Australia. Today's presenters are uh, Dr. Melina Maus, Principal Entomologist uh, from QDAC, um, Tonya Grundy, Senior Development Extension Officer, uh, also from QDAC, and myself. Now I would like to introduce our first presenter, uh, and that's Melina Maus. Mel uh, so I guess what I've been asked to do today is to talk about uh, Paul Armyworm, just a brief update on where we're up to with, I guess, the, the general experience with Fall Armyworm uh, and some of the research and, I guess, preliminary findings from that that I think are, are relevant. Um, but I guess the purpose of the, the webinar today is really to focus on um, some of the things that that uh, we think you probably should be, you know, sort of keeping at the front of your mind as we go into autumn, winter, and then into spring. And, uh, you know, what are the factors that are going to promote or perhaps uh, make less abundant particular pest species? So um, that's what I'll do. I will start with the fall armyworm um, presentation, which... I guess uh, what I wanted to do is really just to run over some of the basics uh, to get everybody on the same page. And I think one of the first things that's become really apparent over the last three years is that the crops that you grow, as well as where you are from sort of north to south, does severely impact the likelihood that you're going to have a problem with fall armyworm or not. One of the things that has happened in the last couple of years is that there, in some regions where uh, we see a very clear um, differentiation between the activity of fall armyworm in spring versus summer, we've seen a dramatic shift in uh, to, towards early planting. So there are a few questions about, you know, in a season where those early planting opportunities, the spring planting opportunities aren't there, does that make a later plant early or does that make it more late? I, I guess we don't know. If, we haven't seen all the scenarios play out in Australia yet. Uh, so we're, we're sort of playing a waiting game. But what you can see in these graphs here is that for the most part, those um, those regions in the north, from central Queensland north, so Atherton, Emerald, Burdekin and Bowen on the, the top and the left-hand side of that graph, what you can see is other than Atherton where there's a lull over winter while there are A, no limited hosts and B, it's very dry, full armyworm activity is pretty constant throughout the year. As we come further south, we see that there are particular periods of high activity and then there are periods of low activity. This is a function not only of fall armyworm abundance in, in the landscape, but also availability of hosts. So for the most part, our data uh, from the pheromone traps that tells us what fall armyworm is doing is based on traps that are in proximity to crops uh, to which we know they're attracted. So largely maize and sorghum uh, and sweet corn. What we don't know, and is a really big gap in our, our understanding at this point, is what contribution do non -crop vegetation does non-crop vegetation make in the landscape? And we really have very little insight into that. Uh, no one, to my knowledge, has started to look at that question of, you know, what might be the role of, of uh, weeds or native vegetation, particularly, uh, I guess, the monocots, the grasses and so on. As we come even further south, what I want to uh, show you is just how constrained uh, the periods of fall armyworm activity are. And as I said before, you know, this is not just a function of fall armyworm being present in the landscape, but of there being avail <clears throat> available hosts for them to, uh, to um, infest. And it's in those uh, periods of infestation that we see the populations increase. So in, you know, just pick a spot anywhere, really, I guess, in the in the maize growing uh, region. So, you know, maybe just say Dolby, for example, what we see as the season progresses, that is that the population increases and overseas uh, data shows quite clearly that the populations will increase as long as that in a local region, as long as there are hosts available. So I think that that's quite clearly what we're seeing here in Australia as well. 
Um, the other thing just to notice is as you go further south, the activity in terms of the number of moths that are, that are caught in uh, pheromone traps declines quite dramatically. So I think, you know, if you compare these sorts of numbers during the season, you know, maximum of 100, for example, with what they, they're getting in um, Bowen over the last few weeks, sort of approaching 1,000 moths a week. So, you know, dramatic differences in what most broadacre growers will face when it comes to fall armyworm from the horror stories that we've heard out of the north uh, to date. Just to give you a sense of, you know, where is fall armyworm now in terms of its impact on crops? Clearly, sweet corn, maize and sorghum are the three crops where it's seen uh, most significantly and are definitely hosts uh, with the potential for significant crop losses. But also capsicum, rosegrass and millet, I guess, if we're talking about summer crops, um, but then also about winter uh, and spring crops, millet is the one uh, that's probably significantly damaged that if you're growing millet, uh, you really do need to be aware that fall armyworm is a, is a risk. And it's very similar to what you see in the other monocots in, in maize and sorghum, for example. You start seeing, um, you know, defoliating damage and then the larvae will burrow into that whirl and, and start to do more significant damage if the plant is, is small enough. Uh, and then there's a whole suite of, of crops in which fall armyworm has been detected, but how that infestation arose is somewhat uncertain or there's very limited uh, experience. So whether we expect to see persistent um, repeat events uh, is unclear at this point. And importantly there in red is that fall armyworm has not, um, as far as I'm aware, um, and I guess talking to Paul Grundy about the work that he's involved in in North Queensland, has not been detected in either conventional cotton or, um, you know, BT cotton to, to this point in Australia. So how damaging is it? And I guess this is the task that uh, DAF and uh, Coffee and Caesar have been given by GRDC to establish economic thresholds, or at least, you know, uh, guidance around how much damage is too da too much, uh, what the impact on yield and quality might be as a result of infestations, and to address um, both maize and sorghum grown either irrigated or dry land. And I guess, you know, we've uh, now in our second year uh, of this empirical work and um, it's progressing very well. One of the really big take-homes um, from this has been that we are seeing significant yield losses in sorghum as a result of heavy infestation, heavy and prolonged infestation of fall armyworm. Um, so what you can see in these pictures here is, is this year's trial site at Gatton where we've got four times the sowing. And I, I put this, um, this profile up, I guess, of the crops because what is very apparent in these uh, later plantings where we had high fall armyworm pressure, so the plants essentially uh, sort of um, nine larvae per plant uh, tolerated at the highest densities. What you see is a sort of wave effect where the plots that were heavily infested or infested for a longer period of time uh, just don't recover the full biomass that, um, that the, the uh, less infested or, or more heavily treated uh, plots experience. So um, what we've seen is yield loss really as a result not only of direct feeding and, um, and defoliation, but the feedback loop between the plant's ability to accumulate photosynthates and then uh, realise yield has been um, the way the yield loss has, has arisen. In terms of what you see, we've seen uh, infertility as a result of direct feeding, so the plants just never... Um, get to the stage where they have the energy to produce uh, a cob or a head. But we also see with the differential rates of infestation along the row, we see plants that are shaded uh, that may have been infested early and then have, have had slow growth. And so we get a, quite a, a significant proportion of the plants. I think, uh, I guess the estimate at this point that the trials are not all harvested is around 20% of plants uh, we'll never realise a cob because they've been shaded out by, um, by the plants besides. So 
I guess it, it really reinforces some of those things that we've we've uh, observed with Fall Army Worm that establishment and managing those establish those infestations early enough to ensure that the plants get away is uh, absolutely paramount. Just a little bit, like another picture that shows, you know, sort of the, the variation in, um, in the impact across those trials. And just a little bit of information about how we've done this. So the, the sowing times also manipulated the canopy density uh, by, by sowing density. Uh, to sort of further demonstrate that a plant with a, a, a crop with a low um, density canopy is at greater risk than one with a high density uh, canopy. So just, just a couple more pictures. So, you know, a bit of a no-brainer, you wouldn't let your crop get to this stage, but um, in the foreground, the crop that was, uh, the plot that was most heavily infested for the longest period of time compared with the crop that was uh, where fall army worm was excluded. As I said, one of the really big surprises, I guess, uh, from this work has been the impact on sorghum. We first saw it in air where crop, the crop was grown under quite cloudy conditions and had a very small canopy. Um, and the fall army worm damage that occurred, the defoliation tipped it over uh, to a yield loss situation. And at Gatton this year, we've seen a similar thing um, in, in uh, the later times of sowing. So when it comes to, to uh, both maize and sorghum, what, what are sort of the rules of thumb at this point? Uh, and I, I just stress that, you know, we have rules of thumb for things like helicoverpa and for armyworm and native armyworms and so on. They have been derived over sort of 30, 40, 50 years of experience. We really had three years experience with fall army worm. So, you know, I, I um, offer these rules of thumb a little bit uh, with trepidation because there are questions about will we see much higher levels of fall army worm in the future? Is this is what we're seeing what we're going to get forever? We, we just simply don't know the answers to those questions. And um, it is a little bit nerve wracking to, to offer rules of thumb, but I think they're important because, you know, you guys are managing crops. It's important that um, we start to, to make some, um, some management recommendations. Monitoring and management and establishment is absolutely critical. Crops will disappear in a matter of days if there are fourth, fifth and sixth instar larvae in those crops. So under warm conditions, that could be a shorter sort of 10 to 14 days after the crops out of the ground. Um, and you're looking for sort of this early stages of an infestation with little windows. By the time you've got fifth and sixth in style larvae, this is the sort of thing you've got the plants are uh, going to die because the growing point is uh, damaged um, and uh, that's terminal. When it comes to the reproductive stages, full army worm are definitely damaging. They can damage the, uh, the integrity of the tassel um, to the point where you may not have an intact tassel at all. Although that's, you know, across a paddock, that's quite rare. They will uh, sever silks as they feed in the terminal end of a cob. Uh, they will also damage the grain and create opportunities for secondary fungal and bacterial infections to, um, to uh, get to the grain inside the, the wrapper leaves. I guess we've done some work looking at uh, quantifying the damage that they will do, but I think, you know, the experience um, of agronomists and so on is, is that largely we're not seeing outside of the really high density infestations, we are not seeing this sort of late season, uh, late uh, in the crop damage to the reproductive stages. I think because if a population is well managed, we're not getting that continuous buildup uh, within that crop. And the other thing that's quite clear from sort of long uh, crop long monitoring is that crops become much less attractive to overposition by the moths, to egg laying by the moths, uh, once they reach those reproductive stages. So the attractiveness declines and particularly in a situation where there are other things being planted or other crops that are that are later in the landscape that they can um, that they can move to. Insecticide resistance has been a really big uh, concern, particularly for the agronomists who've seen um, you know an increase in in insecticide use with helicoverpa result in, in sort of catastrophic uh, resistance development. 
Ball army worm arrive with very high levels of resistance to synthetic pyrethroids and moderate resistance to carbamates, which means that those uh, groups of products are largely ineffective against ball army worm, but susceptible to the suite of, of products that you probably would be looking at uh, targeting them with. This was the result of, of the first screening that Lisa Bird and Nicole Dunn did back in uh, 2020, 2021. They're currently testing uh, again from across Queensland. And so far, the indications are that we haven't seen a shift in susceptibility to this group of insecticides, which is very good news. Um, and I guess, you know, the, the, um, the testing that showed relative susceptibility or lack of susceptibility to those different groups has been borne out in the field, as I said. A lot of the failures that we saw in the first year, 2021, uh, were as a result of, of populations, infestations being sprayed with either pyrethroids or carbamates, and uh, those populations just persisting and causing significant yield loss. You can kill larvae that are in the world. Um, you know, there's a lot of concern about how you actually get chemical to them. I am of the opinion that there is quite a lot of movement by larvae around the plant uh, in our efficacy trials, we see fifth and sixth instar larvae dead on the plants um, after we've treated. Now, those are larvae that weren't out on the leaves when those plants uh, were treated. So these are larvae that are moving around probably at night, getting an, an infect, uh, a lethal dose from residual chemical on the leaves. Uh, and this is the sort of thing that you see hatching larvae in a crop that's been sprayed. They just, um, you know, don't survive any anywhere near as long as, um, you know, it would. They would need to get into the world and get themselves established. So, giving the, these insecticides time to work is very important. And looking at the plant, a lot of agronomists, uh, you know, from my conversations with people who ring up, uh, are attempting to make a decision about full armyworm management based on um, on damage. It just simply doesn't work. Good news, natural enemies, lots of them. Uh, you're probably familiar with all of them if you've been checking crops for a while. So that's, uh, that's really good news and another reason to steer away from broad spectrums. Loads of work going on with fall armyworm um, and uh, a whole lot of different aspects being looked at. And I think, you know, within sort of, you know, five years or so, we will have a really robust um, set of management practices in conjunction with thresholds to uh, to guide uh, decision making. So that's all about fall armyworm. Now I'm going to zip through these ones because I've blah, 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 a bit too long there. Um, what, what to expect? So helicoverpa pressure has been enormous uh, through some parts of spring and summer this year or last year, this year. Uh, which means that there's probably a large residual population going into spring next year of Helicoverpa amidra. There's also likely to be a reasonably large population of punctigia in the west, uh, which, um, if it remains relatively dry over winter, will and spring will move east. So I would, I guess, I think that the risk for Helicoverpa in um, winter crops in spring is um, high. And similarly for native armyworm populations that are probably built up very well on the, uh, the native veg in Western Queensland um, over summer and, and potentially into winter as well if it persists. So that's risk to, to winter cereals, uh, risk to summer pulses, similarly from Helicoverpa. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to mention was the insecticide resistance of Helicoverpa. So New South Wales DPI has an ongoing um, screening for insecticide resistance. The results are available. Um, I think they're on the beat sheet as well as um, available through uh, other, other departmental websites through New South Wales DPI. If you are not um, aware of it, there is a resistance management strategy for Helicoverpa amidra that's available on the beat sheet as well as um, on the GRDC website. If you're growing canola, uh, it is probably one of the most susceptible crops that we uh, have in the system in terms of um, not only establishment pests, but also um, defoliating pests, things like diamondback moth. Um, I've asked Tonya to put this 
uh, information, the best bets that were developed a few years ago up on the on the BetSheet website so that you can have a look at some of these, um, these factors that contribute to the risk profile of these various species. So there's one for establishment pests, one for canola um, and uh, other winter crops. But the one I just wanted to highlight is diamondback moth, you know, really populations, we don't see damaging populations very often, but they are driven by the abundance of, of uh, cruciferous weeds in the landscape. So, you know, perhaps the risk for diamondback moth infestation is uh, higher than it has been for some time. Um, and we've already mentioned helicoverba. One of the things I did want to just quickly highlight is that Caesar um, in Melbourne has done some work for GRDC looking at the off-target, well, not the off-target, but the, um, the susceptibility of natural enemies to a range of commonly, commonly used or re and registered products. Uh, it's probably worth casting your eye over that just so that you're up to date and uh, it's available uh, both from the CESA Australia website but also um, from the GRDC website and perhaps a link from the beat sheet. But I think it's definitely worth uh, having a bit of a refresher on, you know, the relative susceptibility of, of natural enemies. Um, okay, I will provide an update um, on um, aphids. So uh, we are conducting an aphid monitoring program um, uh, for a while, and this graph presents some results on um, level of incoming aphids uh, in fava beans and in lucerne uh, for last year and for this year uh, by 1st of April 2023. So uh, you can see how uh, aphid landing rate fluctuates uh, through seasons and depends pretty much on environmental conditions. Um, aphids uh, infestation can be reduced by heavy rain events. So likely this is what happened um, last year in March because we had quite that uh, period in March and April last year. So that's why uh, likely aphid uh, numbers dropped down and after that didn't recover uh, in uh, Lucerne or in um, uh, faba beans that we monitored um, uh, last season. Uh, we only um, uh, saw and um, recognized this peak that happened in spring period, which was actually yeah, expected uh, spring aphid flights. Uh, after that, numbers uh, were quite low, uh, and um, um, we can see that uh, these numbers are, uh, in Lucerne are actually matching with numbers uh, that we got in our monitoring sites in uh, summer zone uh, fava beans. Um, all um, uh, numbers were quite low, uh, but actually start to rise in um, uh, end of February, beginning of March. Uh, when we actually got some um, uh, colonies of cowpea aphid developed in uh, our faba bean monitoring sites. Um, uh, apart from that, uh, uh, we, we are still monitoring um, uh, lucerne crop. Uh, faba bean uh, was uh, harvested. And apart from that, uh, 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 cowpea aphid uh, infestation, um, there was no any other issues. Uh, however, uh, this um, uh, season was um, quite uh, favorable. There were occasional rainfalls and um, uh, our aphids had quite uh, uh, good establishment in, um, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Lucerne and uh, some other pasture legumes. Uh, and I would say, um, uh, um, according to our results, there were different aphids that were recorded on different weeds. Um, uh, that were more or less interested for us. Uh, however, we found the uh, low numbers of pea aphid and blue green aphid in our um, uh, lucerne uh, monitoring sites. And uh, again, um, uh, pretty um, much developed colonies of cowpea aphid on uh, uh, lucerne. So uh, obviously, um, uh, cowpea aphid uh, is um, uh, having yeah uh, great time uh, enjoying uh, favorable weather conditions uh, and presence of green bridge. And it's uh, obviously uh, waiting for uh, faba bean um, uh, to emerge this season, uh, which uh, could be. Um, 
uh, could be vulnerable. Uh, so uh, faba bean uh, uh, that's emerged, young faba bean is quite vulnerable for cowpea aphid and there is no way to avoid it. It will come uh, sooner or later. So um, please uh, try to monitor your crop uh, because uh, these aphid um, uh, are seen um, at the uh, early emerge faba bean. They form uh, colonies uh, usually, usually on uh, growing tips. Uh, and uh, they usually form colonies in hot spots. So try to monitor uh, at least uh, five uh, points uh, uh, and um, uh, monitor and check at least 20 plants at each point, uh, just to be sure uh, what's happening in your field. So um, uh, uh, cowpea aphid is um, a very good vector of different viruses, including uh, persistent and non-persistent viruses. Uh, which can later uh, uh, affect your uh, crop and at the end uh, yield. So uh, according to New South Wales uh, threshold, uh, treat uh, cowpea aphid in low levels uh, uh, to prevent virus transmission because uh, uh, obviously uh, that's something that we need to think uh, of, uh, already in autumn uh, to, be, to be ready to uh, actually stop their um, transmission or at least suppress their transmission later in season. Um, apart from that, I said that we uh, found low number of P aphid and blue-green aphid in our uh, Lucerne uh, monitoring site. So uh, P aphid is uh, uh, irregular pest of uh, Lucerne. However, um, uh, it is known uh, pest of fava beans. And uh, together with blue-green aphid um, uh, can uh, in, uh, infest uh, fava bean uh, in uh, uh, autumn period. Even though uh, it's more common for these two uh, aphids to um, actually uh, infest fava beans in uh, spring period, uh, it is possible with favorable conditions, which are uh, at the moment uh, happening. Um, yeah, it is uh, possible that these aphids will uh, come in um, fava bean crop and uh, form clusters. If they form clusters, if you see that while observing your crop, you should uh, uh, um, uh, you should spray them because uh, uh, they usually uh, are uh, coming. Uh, so their winged aphids are infesting crop. Uh, however, they're not infesting uh, like cowpea aphid forming hotspots. Um, they are more uh, like evenly uh, spreaded over the crop. Uh, so if you find um, aphids that are coming, uh, that are actually infesting growing tips, you should uh, react uh, because uh, also these aphids are known as good virus vectors, especially P aphid, which is, um, uh, which we found according to our results, that is one of the best uh, uh, pulse aphid uh, vectors um, uh, in fava beans. Um, uh, just to uh, mention that uh, there is aphid management guide, uh, which um, uh, uh, you can find online, and this uh, link will be um, will be uh, attached together with other useful links for you um, and share uh, with you after this webinar. So just to touch base, uh, aphid management should start uh, before um, actually winter season starts. You should uh, control your weeds, uh, control weeds and self uh volunteer crop plants before winter season. Uh, try to uh, sow in stubble because um, uh, sowing in stubble actually um, uh, protects uh, young crop uh, uh, from early aphid landing um, uh, uh, also try to uh, sow crops earlier um, to enable plants to uh, actually be ready for uh, spring flights um, uh, and uh, for further virus transmission that's happening in spring period. Uh, consider moisture availability because um, uh, you should sow in um, uh, full soil profiles uh, because uh, moisture stress crop uh, uh, can't actually compensate aphid damages uh, 
uh, like um, uh, crop that has enough moisture. Uh, of course, uh, uh, you should keep monitoring. Uh, monitoring should be done uh, with if it's uh, uh, regularly, especially dur during autumn season, uh, and try to monitor starting from um, uh, edges uh, of your crop because uh, edges are usually uh, the first um, instance where aphid land and then uh, uh, spread through the uh, paddocks. Uh, especially I would like to uh, mention faba bean aphid uh, apart from uh, these uh, aphids uh, because um, faba bean aphid uh, became a problem to us in last season. Uh, it is um, uh, recently introduced aphid uh, uh, in Australia, however, uh, its distribution spread um, uh, in, um, uh, since uh, two, uh, 2016 very fast. We haven't seen it in 2018 and 19 because of likely because of uh, intensive drought uh, and lack of crops uh, in that period, lack of faba bean. However, after that, in uh, 2020, uh, their um, uh, infestation started to spread to New South, uh, uh, northern New South Wales. In 21, it was firstly found in um, Queensland. Uh, in 22, uh, it spread it to, um, uh, Dal uh, uh, to, to uh, Darling Downs and actually uh, there was first report in uh, Victoria. Uh, and yeah, what can we expand in 2023? Uh, it's likely that this aphid will uh, survive um, using different um, uh, host plants uh, uh, this summer. Uh, I need to mention that we haven't found it in our summer soon fava beans that we monitored this summer. Uh, however, and we haven't found it in Lucerne either. Um, uh, and uh, also there were no reports uh, that are known uh, me uh, here that were uh, uh, that anyone recorded here in northern New South Wales. However, uh, there were reports and I've got uh, one couple days ago uh, from South uh, New South Wales. So it is there. It is just a question uh, when will land um, in our crops. Uh, it's worth mentioning that this uh, aphid prefers fava bean and wedges. Uh, however, it can be, uh, can infest different uh, pulse crops and can survive in uh, lucerne and subflower. Uh, when it's infesting, uh, it's happening very fast. Uh, so you have to be on top of your assignment to check your crop uh, regularly, especially during um, uh, autumn period, uh, because um, uh, when it lands, it uh, forms uh, this uh, intensively um, uh, developed colonies in a few days and covers the uh, whole plant. So start from uh, tips and then covers whole plant, uh, including pots at the end of um, uh, your crop. Um, uh, uh, this is how it looked like uh, last season. Um, uh, so last season, it came very early in um, uh, northern regions. Actually, uh, I don't think it uh, even gone after um, uh, uh, after. Uh, um, previous uh, season uh, because we found it very early in June uh, all over uh, northern New South Wales on um, uh, young plants and also on volunteer uh, fava bean plants uh, later uh, in vetches. So uh, it was uh, present across uh, whole New South Wales uh, and actually um, uh, formed really uh, strong colonies which required chemical control. Uh, this is why um, DPI decided to conduct a small efficacy trials um, uh, to check uh, some available chemical products uh, on market to be uh, used uh, uh, in field for um, control of fava bean aphid. So uh, this study was conducted um, in glass house, uh, please note that. And if you are um, applying um, uh, these chemicals in field, uh, please um, uh, follow label and uh, recommended field rate. Um, uh, in this study, we used uh, uh, imidacloprid as uh, seed dressing and also three uh, foliar um, treatments, pyramicarb, pimetrazine, and sulfoxaflor. 
please know that Sul Foxa floor uh, still doesn't have permit to be used uh, to control fava bean aphid. However, um, uh, Pulse Australia is investigating possibility to um, uh, get permit uh, for minor use of Sul Foxa floor for this purpose. Um, uh, so um, uh, we conducted this experiment in glass house. Uh, um, Imidacloprid was applied uh, before, uh, prior to sowing, and uh, foliar treatments after. Um, and um, uh, uh, those are results. Um, uh, all our uh, treatments actually uh, uh, reduce faba bean aphid numbers compared to control. This is how control looked like uh, 14 days after uh, aphids were inoculated, after aphids were treated with um, uh, um, foliar treatments. Uh, so uh, control um, was pretty much, control plants were pretty much destroyed and uh, faba bean aphid numbers gradually went up until this final um, uh, observation. Uh, imidacloprid, uh, as you can see from this graph, show uh, quite uh, good results, even though it didn't show a uh, knockdown effect three days after uh, aphids were inoculated. Uh, it showed quite good effect seven and uh, 14 days after treatment. Obviously, um, uh, imidacloprid uh, has good efficacy on uh, faba bean aphid uh, uh, in early uh, growth stages. Um, uh, other than that, uh, pyrimicarb and sulfoxaflor showed 100% uh, efficacy in all our readings. Uh, so, um, yeah, and again, sulfoxaflor still doesn't have a permit. However, pyrimicarb has permit, of course, uh, and uh, uh, it's known as um, uh, that it has mild toxic effect on uh, beneficial. So it gives it the uh, advantage, uh, but try to follow, uh, not try, follow the um, uh, label. Uh, pyrimicarb is allowed to be used uh, uh, twice in season. Uh, in order to rotate chemicals, I would ad advise pimetrazine um, uh, because um, uh, it showed uh, really good uh, efficacy seven and 14 days after treatment. Uh, it, it is slow acting chemical, didn't uh, show such a great result uh, three days after treatment. Uh, however, uh, it shows really good results uh, seven and 14 days. So uh, it can be used as an um, uh, option to rotate this uh, chemical uh, later in season together with um, uh, pyrimicarb. Uh, just at the end, I would like to mention that uh, we are conducting also uh, um, uh, uh, a project which analyzes impact of uh, Rutterland bug uh, on uh, crops in northern region. We are collecting uh, samples regularly uh, uh, from winter um, uh, uh, to summer, and we just finished uh, collecting samples for this season. Um, uh, uh, so far, uh, we run into a complex, uh, complex result because uh, in our examples, we found not only retiglin bugs, we found also gray cluster bug. Gray cluster bug is um, uh, uh, taxonomically uh, quite um, uh, uh, similar to uh, retiglin bug, but uh, genetically, they are two totally different species. Uh, in order to um, uh, see difference in these two species, uh, you should have some uh, uh, magnification or microscope uh, because they, uh, they are pretty much morphologically similar. Uh, uh, the, the biggest difference uh, would be when you actually uh, look under the microscope, uh, you can see that um, gray cluster, uh, rotiglin bug is quite smooth and gray cluster bug has hairs uh, on uh, pronotum. Um, uh, so that's the main difference. However, we can uh, discuss uh, some of these morphological features uh, maybe in some uh, other event. Um, uh, if you need assistance uh, with uh, distinguishing in these two species, you can submit uh, your sample to uh, CSIRO, um, and uh, this link will be also included in useful uh, links for you later after this webinar. 
it's uh, important to distinguish these uh, two um, uh, insects because uh, Rutherland bug uh, is major pest in summer crops uh, and gray cluster bug is not. Uh, however, they are sharing same landscapes. Uh, they can find, uh, you can find them uh, at same time in ve uh, very large numbers in uh, native uh, um, uh, um, uh, herbs. Uh, and uh, they can migrate into crops in very large uh, numbers in uh, favorable seasons. However, um, uh, gray cluster bug uh, will not make an issue in sorghum because uh, it, is, uh, uh, it doesn't lay eggs in sorghum. So that's uh, uh, good to know. Uh, you can see here some of our results from uh, last season, from 21-22 season and from uh, this season, so 22 23. Um, uh, this is uh, one of our monitoring sites in Liverpool Plains. Uh, and um, uh, I need to uh, mention that actually uh, uh, last season, we found that um, uh, overwhelming uh, majority of field samples. So uh, this was mainly uh, gray cluster bug. So gray cluster bug was dominating last season in all our samples, except in this example, and that uh, that example in um, uh, late uh, winter season, actually after uh, canola was harvested, this example from um, canola stubble. So uh, in this occasion, we had uh, a Rutherland bug, and other than that, um, uh, in pastures uh, and uh, in mung beans, we had very uh, low numbers uh, in mung beans uh, uh, of great cluster bug in uh, pasture. It was like um, uh, uh, um, uh, moderate numbers of, of great cluster bugs. Uh, totally different thing happened in uh, 22, 23. Uh, so uh, we after November floods, we had uh, a raise in number of um, uh, Rutherland bugs. So Rutherland bug uh, was dominating uh, in pastures uh, and uh, in uh, sorghum in summer crops uh, this season. Um, great numbers uh, um, start to yeah, rise uh, from November after the uh, rain, uh, as I said, uh, and um, uh, in Liverpool Plains, uh, since uh, um, sorghum uh, was uh, planted quite late, uh, we saw increase of Rutherland bugs number start uh, actually from February. That's that was already uh, quite late for um, uh, for uh, sorghum. Sorghum was already in hard old stage, so we didn't. Uh, find any damages, uh, uh, so it didn't actually go over economic thresholds, so um, uh, we was on safe side uh, in Liverpool Plains with Rutherland bag numbers for this season. Um, this slide shows you comparison in numbers in Liverpool Plains and in uh, Belata, so in uh, Murray uh, Plains. Um, uh, greater number were um, caught in um, in Belata comparing to uh, comparing to uh, Liverpool Plains, and uh, as you can see from these um, um, results, uh, uh, greater numbers were in uh, pasture, and actually uh, we had explosion of numbers uh, that we got in our big box uh, uh, samples in sorghum. Uh, again, this was this was quite late, uh, and um, uh, it uh, it happened uh, as you can see from this graph uh, happened beginning of March. Uh, so so uh, crops again uh, didn't suffer. Uh, you can see here from these uh, photos how big numbers were in. Um, uh, crop that was nearly to be harvested. Uh, uh, bugs were covering, both uh, adults and names were covering uh, heads in uh, great numbers. However, uh, crop was, uh, was uh, just about to be harvested and it didn't affect. So that was good. However, uh, these numbers likely move now into uh, pastures. Uh, their numbers are decreasing in pastures likely. Uh, Rutherland bug has a great range of uh, hosts. Uh, so it's uh, it's present uh, across whole year uh, on different weeds, uh, winter crops and summer crops. Uh, 
uh, it is rare. Uh, so uh, it is very rare to actually uh, see damages uh, of um, uh, Rutherland bug in uh, uh, in autumn, but it is it can happen. Uh, it can happen, uh, uh, and in that case, in favorable condition, autumn condition, they could feed in uh, uh, high numbers uh, in in uh, uh, winter crop, early established winter crops, and they can uh, even uh, cause uh, seedling that in that case. But again, I'm repeating that's quite rare. Um, I, in spring, uh, they will uh, start to um, uh, gather in, and uh, form the high numbers from pod filling until maturity of canola. And then uh, summer crops uh, could uh, suffer, uh, especially if they land, uh, if they come in your crop uh, um, uh, from head emergence uh, and stay there uh, through the uh, soft dough uh, stage, they can uh, cause quite high damages. Uh, this can happen in um, uh, wet uh, winter, spring year, and yeah, especially if dry spring, summer happens, you can expect high damages in uh, uh, in summer crops, but we are uh, pretty much far from that. Uh, uh, and we will wait to see what will happen uh, before that. That's from me. Thank you. Thank you and welcome everyone. Um, we're talking about other pests that could be around um, given the weather conditions leading up at the moment. Uh, the triple La Nina, although the tap seems to have turned off in a lot of regions. So wait and see how the weather goes. It will be a, I suspect it'll be a, a fairly localised impact from now on. So um, I'm basically going to give a, a relatively generic overview of other pests. Staff research only covers about one, or one out of the three categories we'll look at this afternoon. And then we only do have done intermittent research on it. Um, most of these other pests are most active at night. They're nocturnal, so effective monitoring is critical to manage them um, before they can do before they do significant damage. And the risk is also higher for many of them if there's a history of them in your local area or in your paddocks. Now that picture there isn't fall armyworm. Um, that's actually mice damage to a cob. They given fall armyworm a bit of a run for their money, but we'll have a bit more of a look at them later. So starting with slugs, they are more common in southern regions than they are in northern regions, um, particularly if there's high um, rainfall, irrigation, or in soils that have high water holding capacity. So um, well, soil moisture is a key regulator of populations. But they can survive in dry conditions by hibernating. Um, it's something to note about slugs is that their hatching, um, the development and emergence from hibernation are highly staggered. So a single batch of eggs can hatch at different times. The um, slugs that emerge develop at different rates. And even hibernation, a rainfall event of three to four inches that can break hibernation won't actually cause all of them to emerge. Now, you can assess risk um, using looking at your stubble levels, looking at predicted weather conditions, and you can monitor using things like um, refuges or bait lines. Just note if you're using refuges to check them fairly early in the morning before the sun hits them, because as they heat up, the, any slugs that are there will disappear back into the soil. Now, management for slugs requires an integrated approach because there is no single control method that will be completely effective. Um, and the majority of management options, such as crop rotations or rolling at planting, actually require prior planning. Um, something else to note is that high insecticide use previously is likely to have knocked back, will knock back um, some predators of slugs, such as predatory beetles. Um, there are other things that do eat slugs, like lizards, frogs, toads, and birds, but again, they probably don't have significant impact if slug numbers are high. Um, slugs themselves are actually surprisingly widespread. 
even though we do talk about them as mainly a southern region issue. Something to note, though, this is from the GRDC website on slugs that have been found in field crops or field cropping regions. The yellow dots on there are actually a striped field slug that isn't considered a pest in field crops, even though you can find it within in cropping areas. So correct identification, as with pretty well every other pest type, is important for slugs as well. Um, if you are interested in further information on slugs, GRDC is an excellent resource. They've got both the um, slugs and crops back pocket field guide and a slug control fact sheet. And the best bets that Melina showed you earlier, um, in the establishment pests sections of them, there is an entry on slugs and looks at obviously assessing your risks and management options at different stages, both pre and post emergent. Um, those are the soil, the soil established ones, ones available in the soil establishment pests area of the beach sheet. Um, there is a link to all of them mentioned in the fact sheet and resources area, but I'll make that a little bit more prominent and easier to find. Um, if we move on to soil insects, um, soil insects are usually not, don't occur individually, they're a complex of soil dwelling arthropods. Those two lines, the one on the top is more northern, the one on the, the second line is more southern, considered southern pests, and they're called a complex because it's complicated. Um, the impact of them depends on crop stage, damage type, pest populations, the potential for compensation, um, current and historical farming system practices, and even the chance of secondary pests or diseases that might impact your yield. Now, the treated seed or insecticide at planting may be an option to consider if you do have a history of soil insects. There are almost no post-plant control options available for them or for most of them. So monitoring before planting is essential. Um, now that can be done by baiting or digging. Digging tends to be more suitable for the less mobile pests such as scarabs, cockchafers, and the highly mobile ones like symphyla that can get easily disturbed when you're having a look at um, the baiting stations. So again, we have further information um, the Beach Sheet and Caesar Australia websites have a fair bit of information about soil pests in general and particularly in some cases specific pests. Uh, I'll, New South Wales DPI will um, make these links available, so don't frantically copy them down at this stage. There are also some how-to videos on baiting. So the top one there is um, about grain baits, germinated grain baits. Um, it's available on the Beach Sheet YouTube channel. There's also a video on the Cotton Info YouTube channel about sampling for all in insects, sorry, soil insects using cut potato as baits. And GRDC has a um, page on managing pests in a stubble retained system that's worth a read as well. Moving on to our final pest, again, we're running very close to time, which is field mice. Saw the picture originally. Now, since the beach sheet put out a, an article in March, there's been ongoing reports of mice around. Hopefully, none of the ones that you can see there. Um, but the report is patchy, though so very large differences in numbers between areas and even within fields. Um, mice normally survive on seeds of weeds and native grasses, and they don't need free water if their food is 50% moisture. Um, they're omnivorous. Uh, their preference of food is inconsistent, which anyone who's tried to bait them around their own house, it can tell they'll take cheese one day, peanut paste another, and won't touch any of it the following day. And an example of mice plagues, 800 to 1,000 is considered a plague, but even 200 mice per hectare can cause economic damage. And the usual... Um, statement of that is about one percent crop damage per night so uncontrolled mice even at that level can knock you back by 15 percent of your yield in a fortnight um, mouse populations i'd say is they are just reproduction machines um, and population increases are more likely after rainfall which is why we're seeing them around at the moment 
although populations are influenced by um, management practices. So stubble retention does encourage mice populations and um, the, well, I've lost my track, Train for a moment, so yeah, they might encourage them, and so they're they're more likely to be an annual thing now than the previous population plagues and and crashes that we've seen in past years. Um, and note that predators have minimal impact during plagues. So predators, predatory birds, foxes, feral cats, uh, snakes do clean up mice normally, but they make absolutely they, 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 and during plagues they just can't cope with them. That's a quick idea of where mice are found in Australia, um, which is pretty well everywhere. And they have a wider range of damage than most other places. Every, everything from digging for planted seeds, chewing cotton balls, eating seedlings. Um, the, oh, the mice and cricket, oh, sorry, the, yeah, the, the damage there on soybeans that you can see is, that, is actually cricket damage, but mice do a similar damage in, in terms of chewing um, in pulses. And, of course, damage to farm infrastructure. Now, as far as monitoring for mice goes, you can check for active burrows by sprinkling talcum powder or um, cornflower around. If you do a 100-metre trans, uh, transect and look um, about 50 centimetres both sides, so you've got a one-metre wide transect, 100 metres long, if you find a single active burrow in that, that's equivalent to 100 burrows per hectare. And if it's an active burrow, then there's probably at least two mice in it. So that's your 200 mice per hectare um, threshold flag for that damage level I was talking about earlier. Something else you can use is also chew cards. That's downloadable from the GRDC website. Just print them out on light card. And um, the 10 by 10 grid, that's four cards that you can see on that um, image there. The 10 by 10 grid, uh, means if you say 10 squares are chewed, you've got an emerging population, 20 squares means that you could have um, a significant problem. Now, mm, uh, general hygiene, making sure that there's minimum spillage during harvest and, and around your silos is an important management technique. Reducing habitats in fields and non-crop areas and zinc phosphate baits are the only chemical um, option available actually out in the paddock. There's other things for around buildings. And they're just flagging that there is a permit for a double strength zinc phosphide product, ZP50, which is um, 50 grams per kilo. Um, the permit for that's been extended to the end of this year, but you do need um, a training to be able to purchase that product. So just finishing up, there's more information available on mice and field crops at GIDC at CSRO. There's a mouse alert website that you can report mice sightings to and check if there have been any around your area, but just be aware that because it's patchy, just because there's nothing on there doesn't mean there aren't mice in your region. And that's the link there for the um, Grain Producers Australia training that you need to um, be able to purchase that um, zinc phosphide 50. And that's it from me. Hi, Ron. Um, yeah, I just I may have missed it in Melina's uh, chat there before, um, just on the army worm. Um, seeing as they're not too keen on sunlight, um, has anyone commented or seen any differences like in dry land, like in sorghum and stuff, skip row, or any differences in that, yeah, the row configurations in that might disturb them a bit more rather than wall to wall planting? Uh, no, I, that's not a, um, I guess an example that I've sort of had any, been part of any discussion on. I think the, um, you know, the avoidance of light is really achieved by them, uh, on an individual plant basis by getting down into the leaf axles and into the whirl and in the, you know, all those leaves that are, um, sort of emerging or, uh, expanding. So, um, the other thing, the other way they do it is if there's not enough canopy cover, they will sit just below the soil surface. And in a, um, you know, in an establishing crop, that's how a lot of the damage, really significant damage and plant death arises in that those larger larvae that can't find enough 
uh, cover on the plant and the little canopy sit down below and feed at the base of the plant, um, killing the plant. So, yeah, no, interesting question, but not not one that I um, have any answers to, Craig. No, that's, that's right. Yeah, just most of our stuff here is is dry land um, across the board. So I was just um, seeing if we could play with anything like that. So, no, thanks, Melina. Then uh, we could uh, conclude uh, and wrap up uh, today's webinar. Thank you uh, for your time today and hope to see you soon. Uh, all the best. Bye.